the Labour Party. She has been doing quite a lot of work talking about um, um, the economy and the cost of living crisis. She's the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation, which uh, is a think tank that was established 35 years ago. Um, and she's also a regular media contributor, I'm sure you've seen her speaking particularly during conference. Um, and she has a wealth of experience in developing and delivering policy. So Rachel, you are so hands. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to stop here because otherwise you know, I'll be dominating this session and you won't really hear much about Rachel. <laughs> so I'm going to hand it over to Miata, um, who's going to start interviewing Rachel right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Anya. I'm so excited about this conversation. We've got two economists, and the thing we must not do is bore everyone with economics. So I think it absolutely needs to be learning about your journey quite an inspiring journey um, and trying to sort of understand uh, the person behind the brain because we all know that you're incredibly impressive, uh, that you've had an incredible trajectory, you're on the cusp of being uh, our next chancellor and we want to sort of take a little time to get to know the person uh, behind uh, the brain. Um, just to start, how are you feeling? It's been a mammoth, mammoth uh, conference. Uh, you gave a brilliant speech. How do you feel? You're almost there, almost at the end of this. How do you feel today? Well, I mean, I've been around politics for quite a while now and fought a lot of elections and lost a lot of elections, so there's certainly absolutely no complacency kicking in with me. We've got to fight for every single vote in every single constituency to get the Labour government. But I do feel more optimistic I'm more confident as we come out of this conference than I have in the 12 and a half years that I've been a member of Parliament. And you know, so much of that is, is down to Keir's leadership. You know, he has dragged our party back <coughs> to being electable um, again. Now, the government have offered a helping hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so some, some of us uh, were questioning whether Cosy might be uh, a sort of deep undercover. <laughs> <laughs> Also, if you think about the journey we've come on as a party, you know, Adam has spoke about some of the conferences we've been through in recent years. But even this time last year, what a difference! Yeah. What a difference in terms of, of the response and the hunger. I think that's the main difference. The hunger now in our party to to win and the determination to do what is necessary to win. And you know, Keir spoke about that in his speech, there's loads of things we want to do, loads of things that drove us uh, into, in, into political activism. And what we're going to inherit is it, going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have to do everything overnight. And that discipline that, that Abner spoke about, that focus, is going to be essential. But, you know, I sort of dare to hope now that we could be in government again. And, you know, after the 12 and a half years that we've been through, you know, it is about time. We will have to um, pick up the pieces that the government has left, but you know, we've done it before, and we will do it again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the, the word for me is belief. Um, it feels like there's just a sense of belief in conference, uh, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. I want to take you to the start. Uh, so you've often talked about uh, your happy uh, childhood and fantastic uh, family, and just kind of interested about the kind of the memories that stick and how they've shaped your politics. Yeah, so um, I was born in, in February 1979, three happy months under Jim Callaghan. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Um, I think Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister. And we didn't see uh, a Labour government until the month before I did my A-levels. Mm -hmm. um, all of my childhood was under Conservative governments. And we did see the impacts, you know, especially at school. My mum and dad were primary school teachers, and my mum was a special needs teacher. But special needs, needs um, teaching was just cut to the bone. Now, you know, that was fine for her. She became a, a classroom uh, teacher. But it wasn't okay for the young people who she supported, who weren't getting that extra support. And it also then put pressure on the classroom teachers and 
when I was at school, and she loved being a special needs teacher, but she wasn't able to do it after about 1986, 1987, because there just wasn't the funding um, at the primary school where I was as a, um, as a, as a, as a, as a young girl. My mum was a teacher, so I remember that. Um, I remember my, my parents' deep commitment to public service. Um, you know, they really believed in, in what they were doing, and I, I, I remember uh, very sort of audaciously saying, teachers do the most important job in the world. And my mother said, well, doctors and nurses are quite important. But she said, well, who teaches the doctors and nurses? <laughs> 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 uh, 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 so, you know, my parents instilled in me uh, a belief in, in public service. And when I left, uh, when I was in, at university in my third year, and I was applying for jobs, and I wanted to be an economist. Um, and I applied for jobs at the Treasury and at the Bank of England. I applied for a job at Goldman Sachs as well. Um, and I was offered the job at, at Goldman Sachs. Um, and the multiples and salary difference between the bank and, the, and, and, the, and Goldman was, was obviously huge. But I think that ethos of public service that I got from my mum and dad meant that I chose uh, the, the less lucrative, but I feel more worthwhile uh, role as working as a public servant at the Bank of England. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud, and that's how I started my career, and proud today of my, my, my role in public service, both as a constituency MP, and I, and I hope um, running the Treasury in a couple of years' time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, female economists, we're a growing uh, breed, uh, and I certainly, you know, both learning it and also entering the profession, and even now, um, always really conscious that you still have to fight uh, to sort of get your voice heard and yeah. fight to sort of own that space. That's increasingly changing and that's partly because of women like you. And so I'm just interested in when you decided that you wanted to become an economist and going into the Bank of England um, as a woman in a still male dominated mm -hmm. profession, how that felt um, and, you know, tips for, you know, growing budding economists out there or really any women in a profession about how you hold your space mm -hmm. and make your mm -hmm. voice heard. Yeah, so economics is very male dominated. I don't know about you, but the textbooks that I um, used at university, there was one that was co written by a woman, um, Macroeconomics yes. and the Wage Bargain, Wendy Carlin. Um, but she was the only female economist who we read at yeah. university. Um, the first woman didn't get the Nobel Prize in economics until, I think, 1992, 1993, um, Esther Duflo. Um, um, no, sorry, Eleanor Ostrom. And, and when she got the Nobel Prize, um, most male economists had never even heard of her. And she was doing groundbreaking um, research, uh, looking at um, managing the commons. So this sort of idea that um, land that is commonly owned, resources that are commonly owned, um, always deteriorate. That was the theory. And she, um, because people would, would the, the tragedy of the commons, that if the commons are owned in uh, common uh, and people will graze their cows on the commons, people would graze too many cows and the, the land would be ruined. And she said, well, actually, if you look at examples of communities managing rivers, communities managing water supplies, uh, communities uh, uh, um, looking after their, their woodlands, actually, it does work because of cooperation and, uh, and, 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 uh, and working together to manage those essential resources. And she sort of disproved this, this age-old theory of the tragedy of, of the commons. And people said, that's not real economics. Because uh, real economics is, you know, the uh, maths and, uh, and, 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 and algebra are increasingly so. Um, so no, there weren't very many female economists when I was studying. And when I got my job at the Bank of England, uh, the graduate intake was 36 of us, and only six of us were women. Uh, it was incredibly male-dominated. Um, there still hasn't been a female governor of the Bank of England. Uh, the Monetary Policy Committee, I think, today is, is still um, two to one, male to um, uh, female. I remember Harriet Harman, uh, a, a great quote from her during the financial crisis, and she said, if it had been Lehman Sisters and not Lehman Brothers, maybe yeah. it wouldn't have gotten this. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, yeah, but, you know, as Abner said at the beginning as well, still never been a female Chancellor mm. of the Exchequer, still not been a, a, a woman Permanent Secretary at the Treasury. 
very, very um, male dominated. And it does affect as well what is regarded as e economics, you know. Yeah. Well, why is childcare so neglected? Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's like infrastructure is roads and uh, energy. Now we all like energy and GB energy is a great policy. But you know, childcare is infrastructure as well. What yeah. is the biggest barrier for women? Yeah. Yeah. when I was at school for the reasons that I sort of set out earlier. You know, when I was in my sixth form, our sixth form was two prefab huts in the playground. Our library at the school was turned into a classroom because there were more students than space, and there was never enough textbooks to go around. And I felt very strongly at my local state comprehensive that the government we had did not care about schools like mine, the communities like mine, and yet I did really well, you know. And actually, I, I thank my school for that. I'm not like Liz Truss that said, you know, thanks to State Comprehensive for getting me into Oxford University, but you were really rubbish. You know? My school was brilliant in really difficult circumstances under Conservative um, governments. So I, I joined the Labour Party when I was uh, 16, and you know, I, I quickly got active. Now, you know, I joined the Labour Party in, in 1996. A year later, we won that landslide of generation. I thought it was so easy. <laughs> 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 um, what have been in opposition for 18 years? <laughs> so easy. Anyway, it turns out winning really elections to Labour is, is not that easy. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, politics is something that I did in the evenings and the weekends. I went to my branch meetings, I went to my constituency party meetings, started delivering leaflets in my constituency, which was probably in Chislehurst. Uh, and then in marginal seats, that uh, Eltham in uh, 1997 was a marginal seat where Clive Edward got elected and there's mm. still the MP yeah. there uh, today. Uh, and I always, my, my, you know, we didn't, we've never had a Labour MP in Bromley and Chislehurst. Mm. You never know. We might. Oh, so we're going to get yeah. that there at the moment. Yeah. Right, we think we're going to win it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Bromley. Bromley. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. we always went to marginal seats, so Bexley Heath and Crayford, uh, Croydon uh, Central. And I really you know, got into, into campaigning and into the party, but I, I didn't really see it as a career or as a, as a job. You know, I did my economics and then you know, contributed to the Labour Party. Um, but gradually over time, I sort of thought, actually, if I really want to make a difference, then I think politics is the way to do that. And, and I, I, I believe very strongly that it, it is politics in the end that you know, changes, changes things. Uh, and I wanted to be at the centre of that. And I, I stood in Bromley and Chislehurst in 2005 against Eric Forth. Um, and then the following year, he died very suddenly. And I then stood in the by-election um, and so I think, you know, by then I'd sort of made up my mind that that's what I wanted to do, but maybe somewhere a bit more hopeful than, than Bromley. Um, I, I then moved up to Leeds, um, uh, or maybe not now. Uh, I, I, I then moved up to Leeds for, for work, and uh, then when the, uh, an MP there retired and I, and I stood uh, for selection, uh, when I won that selection, um, all of the MPs in Leeds, and there were eight MPs in Leeds, all of them were white men mm -hmm. yeah. in a city as diverse mm -hmm. as Leeds. Mm -hmm. And when I was selected in 2010, I was the first woman for 40 years to represent any of the eight Leeds constituencies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, we've got a lot better. But it's really better to uh, and Alice Bacon was the first woman to represent uh, Leeds in Parliament, Leeds North East and then Leeds South East. And uh, a few years later I wrote a book about her because I, I feel I really strongly that every generation of women stands on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. Um, you know, our battles, and there are still battles, uh, and fights to be won, are made a little bit easier uh, by those women who went before us. And, one of the people I interviewed for that book was Gerard Kaufman, who's no longer with us, but he was the um, MP in Manchester Gorton. But he'd grown up in Leeds North East, and his parents had been at the selection meeting when Alice Bacon had been selected. And mm -hmm. I said to him, 
you know, she was only in her early 30s. Uh, and, you know, there'd never been a female MP in the whole of Yorkshire when uh, she won in 1945. So how did she get selected? And he said, well, what you have to remember, Rachel, is that Leeds North East had a conservative majority yeah. of more than 10,000. Yeah. If yeah. the local party members had have thought there was the remotest chance of electing <laughs> <laughs> it's not that they would not have selected Alice Bacon or any other young woman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, 1945, we all remember it as the big Labour landslide. It was also a massive landslide for women. The number of women in 1945 went up from 8 to 24. You know, trebling of the number of women. And many of them, like Alice Bacon, including Barbara Castle, were selected in seats where they thought there was not a, not a chance in there of Labour getting elected. And that's why they were selected. And then the same happened in 1997. You know, so many of those 101 Labour women were selected in seats that Labour had never won before and never thought we would win even in 1997. So those two accidents of history, 1945-1997, got Labour landslides, but also a huge number of women in the Parliament. But we need to be selecting women not just in those marginals, yeah. but in those safe seats, yes. so that women are there for the long yeah. term, not for the short term. Mm. Yeah. So, as we all know, uh, Labour's Women's Network has done an impressive job trying to get that pipeline mm -hmm. of women, um, trained 200 women uh, this year uh, for public office, including uh, myself. You've gone through uh, the selection process. Just interested in thinking about the experience of it and looking back for the lessons you learned and the advice that you would give to yourself back then and to all of us that are thinking about it now. Um, yeah, so I think that the improvements in the selection process in the Labour Party are, are really good and I think particularly help uh, women. The shorter selection um, uh, timetable, the limits on campaign funding um, make it a, a lot easier. Um, my seat was an all women shortlist uh, and that was really important uh, for me because there were lots of favoured sons and there's always a favoured son in every mm -hmm. constituency. Of people who thought that you know that seat was their seat, you know they had a right to it for whatever uh, reason. And having an all-women shortlist made the constituency party think a little bit more creatively. And I think often, and look, this has changed now because there are so many more women in our party, so many more female role, role models. But when you're thinking about you know who to select as an MP or a council, you think, well, who have been the good MPs before? And in Leeds, the people think, oh, you know, Hugh Gateskill, Dennis Keeley, uh, Dennis Keeley uh, Hillary Fenn, um, uh, my predecessor, John uh, Battle. And the problem is, they're all white men. Mm -hmm. And having an all women shortlist made the constituency think, well, actually, what are we looking for? Not like, are we trying to find another one of that person? But what are the skills and the qualities we're looking for in a selection? Now, look, you know, I reckon I could have taken on any of those men and won, but, you know, is that, is that true? Is that honest? You know, in 2007, when the party was still male, very male-dominated, and Leeds particularly was very male-dominated, I think my party membership then was two to one, male-female. Um, all women shortlist, I mean, you know, I benefited from all women shortlists. I think they made a huge difference in changing the parliamentary uh, party putting in the, uh, the idea in your head of what an MP looks like is different now, even to 2007. So um, all women shortlist, I think, that uh, makes a big difference. My selection process went on forever. I mean, it was just crazy. I, and I was working full time um, at the time, but I didn't have children. And, you know, I think that if I were to go through that now with two young children, that would be incredibly hard because, you know, I was balancing work and the parliamentary selection. But work, family and parliamentary selection, when the selection goes on for months and months and months, I think that is really, really difficult. Um, and so I'm really pleased by the changes that the party has put in, it's put in place. And also the fact that now there are so many female role models uh, to support women going for selection. You know, the, 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 um, the Joe Cox Leadership Programme, Labour Women's Network, Baby and Women's Network. You know, there's a lot more support available to make sure that fantastic women are ready for uh, a parliamentary selection. That you don't just learn on the job, but you're ready um, to go when that selection kicks off. Yeah. And as someone who's sort of about to go through the process and 
three young kids, as well as work, as well as this. There is something about the psychology of like, it's, it's a, I keep telling my husband, it's a, it's a six week sprint. It's <laughs> 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 just about survive that any longer, and I don't know how you juggle it. Um, but yeah, it, it is very inspiring to see other women um, and see other women doing it, because I think it is all of us a lot of hearts. I mean, you've been exceptional. Uh, you, you know, your front bench career took off um, impressively. Looking sort of back, what are your proudest achievements? Um, yeah, so I was, you know, a rising star when Ed was um, leader, and I was promoted very quickly. You know, maybe too quickly, because I hadn't had that experience on the back bench. Um, I stood down from the shadow cabinet when Jeremy Corbyn became leader, and I was on the back bench for, um, for, for five years. I mean, the problem is, is that, you know, I came back with Keir was leader, and I've been shadow chancellor for a year and a half. You know, the problem is, is how much can you achieve when you're the opposition party? Thanks for the speeches. Yeah. Um, I've taken some really good amendments. <laughs> you know, you need to be in government yeah. to make those real achievements. I'm really proud of some of the stuff I've done at a local level. You know, it's, but again, it's saving everything. You know, mm -hmm. saving the swimming baths from uh, uh, from closure. You know, saving uh, a children's centre. You know, it is basically trying to hold on to the fabric of the community that was built up over many, many years that is now being frayed and destroyed uh, by 12 and a half years of, of Conservative government. I remember just after I got elected as an MP and uh, um, a housing estate in my constituency and new social housing had been built and I got to cut the red ribbon and the, uh, the, the social housing uh, provider uh, said to me, well, enjoy this, Rachel, because there's not going to be much more social housing bill in the next few years. And it's true. You know, like, it hasn't been like opening things. You know, my, my predecessor, John Battle, was uh, an MP for 20-odd uh, years. He opened loads of things. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> it feels like, you know, Rachel, stop this from closing. <laughs> Um, you know, we need to be in government. We need to be in government to make the, the real yeah. changes that we want to see. You know, I went into a primary school in my constituency recently, and the, one of the teachers said, "Does anybody know what Rachel is?" And someone says, "Isn't she a shadow?" <laughs> <laughs> those shadows, you know, and they, we don't want to be the shadow exchequer secretary, the shadow chancellor, we want to be doing those jobs, and we could do those jobs a hell lot better yeah. than yeah. we are today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I've got to ask you about this, um, so uh, when Keir got COVID and you had to step in last minute, uh, am I sort of, you know, Everyone, I think, was holding their breath for you, and you gave an absolutely stunning performance. Yeah. How is that for you? Uh, are you an adrenaline junkie, or were you absolutely <laughs> pleasure by getting used to it? Yeah, so I'm not an essay crisis sort of person, you know, I, I write my essays before they are due in, and having 45 minutes to prepare for something is not my normal style. Um, now, I was with Keir in the morning, and we were practicing his uh, speech. And then his wife, Vic, uh, texted him and said, "We forgot to do your COVID test this morning. You should do it before you go in the chamber." I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I think "This is really the time." Anyway, so then we both went back to our offices because there'd been a fire alarm that morning. So we weren't even in our offices. We'd gone to someone else's office to practice whilst this fire alarm thing was happening. So we went back to the offices. I went into mine. Keir went into his. And then it was going to be PNQs before uh, the budget. And I went over, as I do, you know, 15 minutes before PNQs. And I said, um, uh, shall I go into the office? And they went, no. And I went, why not? It's 15 minutes. Uh, and they're like, Kia has got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> uh, um, and everyone was just having our little breakdown. <laughs> uh, I said, I need the speech. And they're like, you need the speech? Yeah, you need the speech. So we got a speech, and we went into the boardroom in the leader of the opposition's office, and I just put it on the lectern, and I started reading, and then people started gathering in there. Now, we didn't even have time to print a new copy of the speech, and so it was a speech with Kia's underlining, Kia's <laughs> notes in the margins. <laughs> uh, uh, and, you know, and I, and I, had to, I had to deliver it. 
Um, it was half, so it was October half term, and my husband and the kids had gone um, uh, away for the week and, you know, left me for the budget. Uh, so I texted my husband and I said, I am responding to the budget, put the telly on. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, so if it's not a budget, and it's like a fiscal statement, like it was on Friday, not a budget. Um, uh, I say, kids have good luck, and I said, I'm just going to go and do a COVID test. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but so I said afterwards, I don't know why you always prepare for your speeches, Rachel. 45 minutes sounds about right. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a massive opportunity, um, you know, for me, really, in in, in, high, in hindsight, but. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty scary at the time. And although, obviously, I've spoken loads of times from the dispatch box, in a chamber that packed, I hadn't ever done before. And obviously, Keir does it every week, the Prime Minister's questions. And, the, and there's so many Tories, right? There's so many of them, there's so many of us. And they shout. And I thought, oh, they'd be nice, because I only had 45 minutes to do this. But they're not nice. <laughs> they are just screaming at you. This could be really off-putting. Now, you, you know, actually, the only thing people can hear is, is you through the microphone, because uh, it's good like that. But all you can hear is this screaming coming at you. And you, you, your colleagues are behind you, so you can't see them. All you can see is these people who want you to fail. So it was very daunting. And I, I you know, Keir obviously does it every week, but for me, you know, no time to prepare. Maybe that was the best way, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for what was uh, thrown at me. But, uh, yeah, for, 45 minutes notice is, is yeah. what I had. Well, you, you knocked it out of the park. Yeah. 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 So, for last week, obviously, I had a little bit longer to prepare because we knew it was going to be me responding to the Chancellor. Um, and one of the things that you have to try and prepare for is what the rabbit out of the hat is going to be. And me and Pat McFadden, Shadow Chief Secretary, and my team had loads of pieces of paper for responding to the rabbit. And none of them had, we're going to cut the top bit attached. One percent of people for 45 people, we had things in there like, and we're going to increase the minimum wage by the largest <laughs> ever amount, or you know, we're going to do whatever to help working people because we just thought they would try and do something to make it difficult yeah. for us. You know, we are not prepared for what they did because it is totally wrong, totally yeah. crazy. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's interesting because we don't see that wall of noise. I've heard it described uh, like that before. When I remember um, when I was an advisor for Ed, he would always say, that you've, got to, like, you've got to work through that wall of noise. Um, and, you know, you've been up against some pretty formidable men, you know, go and do that in our you know, it's, 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 But you just interested in how it felt different with those different um, opponents. Um, what the relationship is like, because we only see this very adversarial type of politics. Are there good mm. relationships behind uh, the scenes? Um, and are they really terrified by your big brain? So, it is different with the different people you're shadowing. Um, Michael Gove, I mean, I expect that, you know, there's not much love for Michael Gove um, here, but I saw him to shadow. You know, he was very charming, mm. he reaches out. When I got appointed as Shadow Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, uh, when he first became leader, um, he uh, tweeted something about, you know, the political <coughs> readers and stuff. He then direct messaged me on Twitter uh, and gave me his telephone number. And if I ever needed anything, like, are you making, I said, you know, are you making a statement on Monday because there's some speculation you might have Yes, I plan to make a statement. This is what time it might be. I can't give you all the details, but it's really good to focus on this. I was just like, it was very helpful, slightly disarming. <laughs> um, but we had a good relationship, um, a professional relationship, and you know, it was made life a little bit easier. Um, but it was good politics. You know, it was good politics for him, and uh, and 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 it's a really should behave. Yeah. Yeah. She's seen that. He never contacted yeah. me. He never made eye contact. I don't know you now because we go into treasury questions 
And, you know, we have prayers. I don't know if you notice, we have prayers before the questions start at the beginning. And so you, you go in a, a few minutes uh, early to get your space. And, you know, we're sitting opposite each other. And you never made eye contact, contact with me, not once. Mm. Really, really weird. Um, yeah. so, um, the only communication the other thing was I wrote in the note when he resigned, saying, I'm sure it was a difficult decision, but I think it was the right one. Oh, and he never, ever <laughs> wrote to me, uh, uh, contacted me. There was nothing really, really odd. And, I mean, you know, you saw your part during the leadership conference. <laughs> just not talk exactly the politics. Mm -hmm. you know, he got promoted so quickly to that role. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't build up the relationships. Now, obviously, I don't know about the Conservative Leadership Contest, but, you know, I, I just don't think he built up those relationships with, with colleagues to give himself, uh, you know, <coughs> enough sort of support during the difficult times. Um, Cross I, I don't know. Yeah, I wrote him a note uh, when he got appointed. Uh, and I said, you know, you've got um, an amazing, you've got been appointed to an amazing job. It's a huge privilege to do. I look forward to seeing you across the dispatch box. I don't know what he'll be like I, 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 as an opponent. Um, I mean, you know, obviously so far he's just been incredibly helpful. <laughs> <laughs>
most excited about and what are you most terrified about? Um, so I, I try to focus on what I've got to do to get there, mm. rather than thinking too much, you know, I don't want to be too disappointed if it doesn't happen. No, I don't. It's going to happen, it's going to happen. Um, what am I excited about? You know, like, it's what I was saying before, you know, what's my proudest uh, achievement? I think I've done loads of great things, but I haven't actually done anything that changes people's lives. And that's what I'm most excited about. We've now got, we have seen it this week at conference, so many things that we want to do. Um, you know, whether it is the more doctors and nurses in the NHS that I announced yesterday, uh, the GB Energy Plan, the, the National um, Wealth Fund, um, you know, Bridget will be talking about uh, uh, skills and childcare tomorrow in her speech. There's so much now, we've got map plan, we, we've got um, uh, plans. I think the biggest challenge is going to be the, the, finance, the public finances that we're going to inherit. You know, what they're doing now is adding 50 billion pounds to the national debt every single year. Uh, now, hopefully they won't have much more time to cause much more damage, um, but it, it is terrible what they're doing. You know, and all of this extra borrowing for what? You know, not for investment in our health service, not for investment in the industries <coughs> of the future, but money that's going to go to cut taxes for the wealthiest. And at the same time, they're leaving all this money on the table from the big profits that the energy giants are making. And, uh, you know, every penny that they don't tax those windfall profits is more borrowing and more government debt. And, and that is what we're going to inherit. Now, look, I think we can do a huge amount, even in those circumstances, but I think we also have to be honest and realistic about what we can achieve and, and how quickly. I mean, that means that we need not just one term, but two terms and three terms in government to make the changes that we all need to see in politics. But, you know, we've seen this week, or since Friday, in the response to the financial markets, how important it is to be fiscally and financially responsible because you know, we've got to manage the economy in such a way that doesn't put up inflation and interest rates because who suffers when that happens? It is people on modest incomes, people who have bought their first home, uh, uh, people who um, you know, <laughs> need to know how much the weekly food shop is gonna cost. So we've got to do all these things, but we've also got to manage the economy uh, responsibly um, because that matters so much to people's everyday lives. The, the one thing that sort of strikes me is that we have a government that's really extreme, um, yeah. feels really extreme. Mm -hmm. um, and just interested when you're kind of talking to, you know, people on the Conservative benches, obviously not those at the front line of this current administration, is there a sense, and actually when you're talking out in the public, when you're talking to your constituents, that it, you know, it feels like they're so far from where the mainstream is? Well, I think, you know, a lot of Conservative MPs, are, are, you know, are very anxious and worried. And Julian Smith, former government chief, with former Northern Ireland secretary, you know, tweeted uh, about the, the cuts in the top rate of, of tax. John Glenn, who's you know, the longest ever serving Treasury Minister, uh, you know, was clearly in the chamber, I, I would say horrified about what the government um, are doing. You know, I think that some of the things they said, like this 45p thing, you know, if, it doesn't have to be a done deal. Mm -hmm. you know, Conservative MPs can say this is the wrong priority. And if it is the wrong priority, they can vote with us to stop it from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I hope that some of them do do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I would be remiss if I killed our time, and I think we're about to wrap up, but I really need to ask you about being a mum uh, in Parliament, because it's a really, really tough has it felt that it's got easier or does it still feel like we've got an uphill struggle? So the, the first um, the first four cabinet ministers, only one of them had married at Barber Castle and none of them had children. Um, because I think it was so difficult to combine a job at the top of politics as a woman and also have a family. Um, the first woman obviously was elected to parliament in 1919. It wasn't until 1976 
the a female parliamentarian had a baby while serving as an MP. Mm. That was Helen Hayman. Mm. And there could not have been a worse time politically because Labour's majority was wafer thin and falling in a series of by-elections. And um, the pairing system that you could be paired with an opposition MP uh, uh, to cancel each other out had been suspended. Uh, and so I think eight days after having her baby, she was back in the House of Commons voting. Uh, and the baby was left in the whip's office, there was a, a whip while she went to vote, and then the whip would go and vote. Um, you know, it was just not... Uh, 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 now, in 1979, she lost her seat, Helen Heyman, and I, I, I asked her about that, and I said, did you ever think of re-standing? She said, I didn't think it was possible to be a mother and a member of parliament. Um, now, I don't think that's the case today, and that is because of the women that have gone before us who have done that. Um, and, you know, women like, particularly I say women like Harriet Harman, um, but, but, but many others as well, who are real inspiration to, to, to me and my generation. first uh, child in, in 2013, so two years after I was elected as, uh, as an MP, and my second in two, 2015. In the 2015 general election, I was in the shadow cabinet, and I was eight months pregnant at the time of the general election. And I did an interview, and I said that the first thing that I was going to do if I was appointed Secretary of State and Labour government was to cancel the bedroom tax. Um, and the, I, you know, and obviously there was some positive reaction to it, but then there was um, a piece in the Daily Mail the next day that said, um, and they also said this article that I was pregnant, said something like, um, Rachel Reeves should not be in the appointed to the cabinet because she will not be able to give the job the focus she needs if she has a baby. Mm -hmm. um, Think of like all the amazing jobs that women do, um, and, and, and they have babies when they're doing the job. But apparently, you know, you can't be a cabinet minister if you have a baby. Um, and there was a phone in on LBC um, about whether I should be appointed to the cabinet <laughs> in the election. And people were saying, you know, I don't know Rachel, but I don't think she has thought this through. <laughs> <laughs> judgment on, on this and it was like it was it was like it was a controversial issue <laughs> uh, I, you know that was in 2015 I also remember now now I think 38 degrees is a great campaigning organization but after I had my second child um, you know your, your voting record is blank if you're on maternity leave and they sent an email to all my constituents on their mailing list and it said where was Rachel Reeves <laughs> uh, and they hadn't bothered to check where Rachel mm. Reeves was, you know, probably breastfeeding a tiny little baby. Mm. Um, and luckily one of my constituents wrote back to them, emailed back to them and said, I can tell you where she was, she was on maternity leave, um, and the full 38 degrees. Now, they were very, very apologetic. But the fact is, if you check my voting record, if you don't say, oh, she didn't have an opinion on that, oh, she couldn't be bothered to mm. turn up. Now, that has changed. We've now got proxy voting, six months for new parents, mums and dads. That's great. Mm. It makes a big difference because that pressure to be in Parliament when you've got a newborn mm. baby on important votes, you know, it is very real. But I think it is really, really important in the early days and months of a baby's life that you're at home. Yes. Mm. You know, that nurturing experience, that bonding is just crucially mm. important. Um, and I think that proxy voting system now enables um, women to be mums and to be parliamentarian. So there has been a, a lot of progress, but none of that progress would have been possible without those women, starting with Helen Heyman, Harriet Harman, Diane Abbott, many, many others who did make huge sacrifices mm. uh, to, to be parliamentarians and, uh, and, and good mums. Um, and I think they've made it a little bit easier for, for our generation. I hope that my generation, the changes over the last few years, will make it a little bit easier for, 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 for you and people who come in at the next election.
watching you do what you do, uh, watching you stand so um, impressively is really inspiring. Um, and as you say, you stand on the shoulders of other women and many of us will stand on your shoulders. So thank you. has come in via our Facebook page, just whilst I'm taking uh, the microphone around. That came from um, Councillor Sharn Martin in Grace Manchester, and she asks, Rachel, what is your proudest moment? <laughs> Hi Rachel, I'm Melissa, I'm a delegate with the Patchwork Foundation. Um, I, I think we both did, or I'm doing the same undergraduate degree that you did, um, and I also had to study Carlin and Soskis for finals, um, and I just was wondering, how did you, what did you, did the economics that you learned during your degree and, and studies help in your role at the Bank of England as Chancellor? Because sometimes I try to translate those theories into real life, and I was wondering where, how, is it macro or microeconomics? Where should I focus on and allow my studies to help me understand the real world? Hi Rachel, I'm Jenny. I work for Zurich Insurance and I'm quite lucky we I benefit from we have a brilliant flexible working policy, but it's still an absolute struggle as a young mum trying to sort of develop my career, particularly for certain areas within the wider financial services. But I suppose if you had one thing that you would sort of request for businesses to do sort of to go forward from flexible working, what would it be? Thank you very much. Last couple of minutes. Hello Rachel, Margaret Pinder, Beverly and Holden, the CLP. Um, having worked in the city and on Wall Street, I know the kind of testosterone that surrounds things like <laughs> finance and law, and I think we know when you talk about standing on the shoulders of women coming before, the Tories make a lot about the fact they've had, you know, the only female leaders. But I think you agree that maybe we offer better role models actually for women. And the thought of having the first female chancellor is very exciting because I think that for women coming up, whether they're the women of colour, any kind of women, you don't believe you can do it until you see somebody else in that role. And I think what's going to be hugely important is to see the that we have a female chancellor, the first female chancellor ever, and then the Tories can basically suffer on that. <laughs> She will be doing some stand-up comedy at the Fabulous Feminist Festival. Okay. <laughs> 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 I want to say um, thank you for the questions. So the first question is for Melissa from Patchwork Foundation, who's doing the same degree as you, um, and wants to know if it helped you in your role in the Bank of England, um, macro and microeconomics. The second from Jenny from Zero Insurance. Um, it's about flexible working policy. What is the one thing that you would um, suggest for businesses to do? Um, the fabulous Margaret, who will be at our feminist Christmas party, just said about essentially how you're going to be a great role model, role model being the first female chancellor. Well, thank you very much. Um, but, oh, I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, th th thank you for, for all of those um, questions. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think it is useful in politics to have experience outside of politics. Uh, and certainly my career um, working in financial services, particularly at the Bank of England, clearly equipped me to do this job. Uh, in the summer, uh, you probably uh, um, saw this, heard this as well, 
as Liz Truss said that she was fed up with the Treasury's abacus uh, economics. And we thought, well, abacus means that you can add up. Which obviously was quite essential for running the Treasury. <laughs> One of my qualifications is that I can add up. Uh, <laughs> I can do a little bit more as well. And uh, you know, macro and micro are both really important. I did quite a lot of econometrics as well when I was at university. But you know, the macroeconomics and the, the, the fiscal policy, the monetary policy, I guess that's always been of, of most interest to me. And I hope I can put it to good use uh, in, in a few months or a couple of years' uh, time. Uh, the question about um, flexible working, what businesses can do. I think that the biggest, um, the, the biggest challenge is um, helping mums after maternity leave to get back into work. And that is the stage when we start seeing the earnings gap um, uh, really open up. Yeah. It's sort of all right up until then, um, but then mums um, um, often go back um, into, into, uh, into part-time work, that's fine. Just get them back uh, uh, in, into work and do what is necessary. You know, whether that's flexible working, whether that's some uh, working from uh, home, whether it is hours that fit in with school holidays um, or, or the rest of it, because all the evidence shows that if women don't come back after maternity leave, uh, their earnings then through the rest of their life are lower than what they would otherwise uh, be. And so I think businesses should do whatever it takes to help get women back after uh, maternity leave, because that is a huge loss to the economy. Uh, the, 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 the women that we lose at, at, at that stage. Um, uh, Margaret's uh, wrong question. It's lovely to see you again, Margaret. Uh, yes, I mean, I think it will be uh, uh, brilliant when uh, I'm running the Treasury. I the way that so many women have been an inspiration to me. from the National House Building Council and also a fellow economist. Um, as the first female shadow chancellor and soon to be first female chancellor, no doubt you've had to navigate relationships with the likes of the Treasury, Bank of England, financial regulators, so on and so forth. As a female doing this position for the first time setting precedent, how have you navigated those relationships and could you provide some insight? Sorry. Um, Kelly Diverish from Running for CLP, Women's Officer, and Stay at Home Mum. Um, going back to the lady you described that had to leave the baby in the wits of his office, what is your take on Stella Creasy's work to change rules allowing babies in the chamber so that she can participate in debates before votes, um, and possibly extending to her Mother Red programme to help more women stand for election? Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Rachel, thank you. Um, really interesting to understand the, diff the um, connection between childcare care and the economy, because certainly lots of women work in childcare, but in order for us to go back to work and be as you know, economically engaged as possible, childcare is huge. It's so extortionate at the moment, it's really ramped up in price, um, and I don't know whether we're really on that, thank you. Um, oh. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I'll try and take those, those three questions in, in turn. Uh, uh, when I first started working in financial services in the, um, in, in the early 2000s, it, it was incredibly male dominated. It, it still is, but it's changed a huge amount uh, in the last 20 or so years. Asset politics as, as well. So um, look, those organisations, the, the, the Treasury and the, and the bank, uh, um, are, are still very male dominated, but they're much more diverse institutions in all sorts of different ways 
um, than they were when I started work. Um, one of the, um, a, a woman who I studied with at, uh, at university and then started at the bank with in, in, in 2000 is now the chief economist um, at the Treasury and the chief economist of the whole of the, the government economic service. Um, she's the first woman to ever have done that role. Um, the, the Chancellor should not have sat the, the permanent secretary of the Treasury, but there are now two women as acting permanent secretary of the, of the Treasury. So we are beginning to see changes in, in these institutions. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that's a very welcome thing because you know, if you're not recruiting, promoting uh, um, women, then you're missing out on a huge amount of talent and you don't get that diversity of opinion that I think comes from having people from all different backgrounds uh, with, with, uh, with different experiences. Actually, I'll, I'll move to the, 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 the third question because I think it is um, related as well about the, the issue of, of, of childcare. We need good quality childcare, at least to the question from the lady from Zurich as well, to help keep women um, who, who want to be in the workplace in the workplace. Uh, and that means having affordable childcare, but also flexible uh, childcare that fits, that fits around the hours uh, that women work. Um, Bridget has been like, very upfront in saying that she wants that to be a big plank of our next general election campaign, uh, a, a real offer on childcare to, uh, to help the children get the very best start in life. Remember Sure Start? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to ensure that children get the very best start in life, but also to help parents, and particularly women, uh, be able to, to do the jobs that they uh, want to do. Um, on the question about taking uh, babies in, into the House of, House of Commons, I have got some mixed views about this, if I'm, I'm honest. Um, because I wanted to have maternity leave at home with my baby. And one of the things that I'm slightly worried about, if you say you can bring a baby into the House of Commons and take part in debates and you can vote, I am worried that then that puts pressure on women to come back to work sooner than they might like. So your constituents say, oh, I want you to uh, speak in this debate. You say, well, no, I, I'm afraid I can't because I've got a, you know, a young baby at home. I know you can, because you can take babies into the House of Commons now. I, I'm not sure if that's a route that we should go down, because I want women to be able to spend those early uh, uh, weeks and months at home with their baby, forming that bond, rather than bringing them into work. You don't do that in other workplaces. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what I want to see in the House of Commons. I think that, you know, it's horses for courses. Different people want different things. Um, but for me, that, that wouldn't have worked, and that would have put, I think, extra pressure on me that I, I wouldn't have wanted. Yeah, I mean, look, I think things have improved because you've got someone to vote for you by proxy now. Um, and I, I felt I was able to take time uh, off. You know, I did go back and start doing constituency stuff, um, but I thought that was fine. And I did take six months off when both my children were, were born from the House of Commons. Um, and, you know, I think that's even easier. I don't know, I don't know easy. I think, that's, yeah, it, I think it is easier now because of proxy. Uh, voting. So um, I think that actually the reforms that have been put in place that are, are do make things a lot better. And I sort of feel like I, I did get maternity um, uh, leave. Yeah, and fine. I, I started doing some stuff in the constituency, but you know that that was my my choice. And you can now have uh, extra money to employ someone in the constituency. But you know, again, I just got councillors or my caseworker to you know take on a bit more responsibility or while I was off, which was a good development opportunity for, uh, for, for them. So I'm not saying that um, you know, everything's, everything's right, um, but I, I do feel that like I did have maternity leave with my children. And I don't want people to think that the sacrifices you have to make as a mother in Parliament uh, you know, are you know, so um, onerous. I, I think you can do this job and do it really well, including when you have a newborn baby and including when you have young children like I do. Yeah. We're going to take the last three, can I be nice and give it deep, four rounds of questions. If we could just keep it very short, very quick, then we'll be able to give Rachel the time to respond. So, um, I should be able to see if my glasses are up to the children. So, um, if you could pass the mic to the woman standing there. I have a very cheeky question, 
whether Rachel would do a picture with my constituency delegate Katie and her daughter Meadow, who you've seen have had to go in and out of the chamber. Katie's our CLP delegate and a local councillor in my ward. I was elected as an MP in 97 on an all-women shortlist. My neighbouring MP, Natasha, elected in 2005, had to take maternity leave. Dennis Skinner and myself introduced her and Dennis said, now Natasha, this can't be nearly as scary when she was making a maiden speech as having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a great comment. But it was only when we got in that we started talking about things like domestic violence and issues like that. And it's so important. But I want Little Meadow, when she becomes Prime Minister, to look back and think, I was inspired by Rachel Reed. <laughs> Women in positions 
there's a lot of power like I am, but the researchers and the staff in the House yes. of Commons. Yes. And, and, you know, we've got to, as, 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 as women in, in, in the party, make sure that their voices are heard. But this is not just about your, your gender or your sex. This is about the abuse of power. Yeah. And yeah. young women and young men are the victims of that um, abuse. Yeah. Um, but there are things like the, you know, the, there is a, the, the violence in, in politics. And, uh, you know, the Joe Fox was a good friend of, of, of mine. Um, and, you know, it, is, it can be a, a scary place. And certainly after... You know, Joe's murder, every time you did a surgery, you thought, you know, what is, you know, what, I, for a while we had police at my surgeries um, because of, of, of risks and, and, and threats. And, I, I, you, know, you know, obviously men are also the victims of that, but you do feel, especially after what Joe happened, that much more um, acutely. Um, the third question was, oh, I've forgotten exactly what your question was. It was just about how you felt with regard to the frustrations of you being so incredibly qualified and yet they'd be, they would get called into question when Cross is yeah, tenuous yeah. link to economics is that he's a coinage historian. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> um, you know, so we, 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 we've just got to win. Of course it is frustrating. Being in opposition is so frustrating. Um, but I feel like for the first time in a long time, there's a real hunger there in our party to win. Yeah. Um, and that gives me strength and confidence that, you know, and I met some of our PPCs this morning in, in seats like um, um, uh, Erewash in, um, uh, in, in, in um, Bishop Auckland, but uh, those are seats that we lost, you know, not too long ago. But also in Shipley that we haven't held since 2005, cities of London and Westminster that we've never held. You know, really fantastic and a diverse range of candidates. And, you know, I really feel I've not felt this optimistic in the 12 and a half years as I've been a, I've been MP as I do today. I think the hunger is there. I think the ideas and the vision um, are there. And I really think that, that, that we can do it. Um, in, in answer to the, the last question, um, you know, as Adam has said at the beginning, I was I, I was a chess player uh, when I was uh, little, and I remember um, my sort of first. Um, my, my, my first of feelings as a feminist were um, at, at, at primary school um, playing in a chess match and uh, my male opponent, because they were pretty much all boys, um, his friend came up to him and said, oh, lucky you, you're playing a girl, you're a fracture. And as Crosby Carting is learning, uh, they've not thrashed me. <laughs> Yes, 
just wanted to remind people on that point about um, uh, parental leave for counsellors, that Labour Women's Network uh, has done a lot of work with the local government association on that uh, issue. We began this piece of work about four years ago when there was only three uh, local authorities in the whole of the UK uh, where counsellors uh, were, uh, could benefit from an official parental leave policy and clear expectations uh, and distribution of their work elsewhere and the uh, guarantee of coming back to the same position that you held when you went on maternity leave. Uh, thanks to our work with the LGA, that is now up to over 30 councils. Yeah. That is still only 10% of all the local authorities in the UK. So if your council or your Labour group do not yet have it, you can find all the documents if you Google parental leave LGA Labour. Uh, and really it's been members of Labour Women's Network pushing that through their councils that have got that uh, coverage up. So please keep helping us make sure that provision is not patchy for everybody. I also, you know, breastfed through chairing very uh, grumpy meetings about yep. bin swaps, etc. <laughs> so uh, uh, we've got to make sure that's not the case for the generations coming forward. Hello, my name is Catherine Kay. I'm from the Chartered Insurance Institute. Um, I just wanted to know who your greatest uh, inspiration or role model is outside of politics um, that you think has helped shape your characteristics to the lady you are today. Okay, I won't answer the first question, so I think Claire um, uh, did that very well. Um, well, that, what a great way to, uh, to, uh, to end. I am going to say one in politics and then I'll say one uh, 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 outside. So, um, women in politics, the person who I just think is absolutely amazing is a woman called Ellen Wilkinson, who yeah. was um, uh, um, uh, uh, in Clement Attlee's um, government, I think the fourth, um, no, the, the, I think the second woman to ever serve in a, a cabinet. And, she died two years into um, Atlee's um, 1945 government, but in that time she raised the school leaving age uh, and she introduced the free school meal and uh, the start of free school meals uh, in, in schools. And she was, um, she was very small and she was she blamed on uh, the poverty um, that she experienced when she was growing up. She was so small that she couldn't be seen above the dispatch box in the House of Commons. And so when she made her speeches as, as a government minister, she had to stand next to the dispatch box, not in front of it. Uh, which I think shows how much Parliament and the House of Commons is very much designed as a debating club for men. Um, but she smashed through that. There's also this wonderful story that the early women MPs, they all wore what they sort of described as a uniform for women MPs. They wore black skirts and jackets and a white blouse. Um, and, and sometimes a, a little hat. In fact, it wasn't until the late 20s that you could go speak as a woman in Parliament without wearing a hat. Um, but uh, she sort of broke that mould and turned up for her maiden speech, I think, in a bright turquoise dress. Uh, what a fantastic woman. Um, a woman outside of politics, um, I, the woman who I, I take a huge inspiration from is, is my, my, my paternal grandmother, um, who was, she, she her job, they, were, they lived in Kettering uh, with the big shoe factory uh, industry. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> she, she worked, my granddad worked in the shoe factories and my grandma worked from home and her job was to, uh, to turn rope into shoelaces. Uh, and the glue in that uh, um, made her very ill uh, and she got cancer um, from that. Um, she was an amazing woman. She didn't have very much. She, she grew up in poverty, had very ill health all her life. But everything that she had, she gave back. Uh, she was a salvationist in the Salvation Army. She ran the Women's Fellowship. She ran the Over 60s Fellowship. She worked in a charity shop. And I take huge inspiration from her because even if we have very little, we can always, there's always people worse off than us. And we can always contribute and make the country and the community that we live in a, a better place. And she's a huge inspiration for me. Mm -hmm.
But I think that your insight has um, opened up a lot to members in this room. I've had messages from some people that have said, Donna who said that you know you're great and funny, funny. Ellie said that this is a great event idea. Um, and she love and she loves the fact that men are here because men should care about women's experience in politics. So I want it. where she had 15 minutes to prepare, um, which shows you know that she can hit the ground running. Yeah. And her yeah, exactly. fact, um, experience as well in terms of her political journey shows, you know, as at the first you don't succeed, try, try again. And that should be resonated to all of you in this room, particularly if you are thinking about going for public office. Don't give up at the first hurdle. Um, I also want to say thank you to the association of British insurers again for this event because you have helped us um, take this event forward. But I also want to say thank you to the rest of the LWN committee, but particularly to Kat over there, to Janet, um, to Jane, um, and Claire, and also Nan Sloan. Without them, this event wouldn't have existed. They literally worked their guts off. And I think we're going to go for a break after this um, this evening. Um, and also, I'm going to be selfish right now and do a shout out to Bexley and Village Massive. <laughs> Event. We're going to do photos at the end, but we would love to do a group photo just to let Quizzy Quarter and get shaken in the <laughs> <laughs> the amount of support that Rachel has about around him, around her. For <laughs> you, sisters, if we can ask you to just stay in your seats, and then Rachel, Amiata, and Abner, if you could just literally come here and say something.